This episode of Primitive Culture is brought to you by Audible.com, offering more than 180,000 titles for smartphone, tablet and desktop. To get a free audiobook of your choice and to help Trek FM at the same time, visit audibletrial.com slash trekfm. And also by Enterprise in Space, an international program of the non-profit National Space Society. Find out how you can help science and education and become a virtual crew member aboard the NSS Enterprise Orbiter by visiting enterpriseinspace.org. And if you want to join the conversation and share your thoughts on this episode, join the Babel Conference, our listeners group on Facebook. Just type B-A-B-E-L into the Facebook search field. We look forward to seeing you there. This is Tim Russ, Lieutenant Commander Tubok on Star Trek Voyager, and you're listening to Trek FM. Open your mind to the past. All this may mean something. I've been coerced into watching tonight's movie. You do have books in the 24th century. It's a primitive culture. I'm just trying to blend in. Some people think the future means the end of history. We haven't run out of history quite yet. Hello and welcome to Primitive Culture, a Trek FM podcast all about our history, our culture and how Star Trek relates to it. I'm Duncan Barrett and today I'm joined by Tony Black. Hi Tony, how are you? I'm good Duncan. It's nice to uh, once again be back on to uh, talk about a topic which has me fully revived this week. Oh well I'm glad to hear it because I was going to say it's, <laughs> it's, it's been a while since we've had you back on Primitive Culture I think it feels like a lot of time's gone past I sort of uh, I feel older wiser <laughs> maybe a little bit more prejudiced probably a bit wider around the waist uh, you know it, it just feels like an age really since we were last together uh, talking Star Trek. Yeah do you feel like you've got a little bit more right wing as you've got older? Because that's what they say. Almost, almost certainly, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Especially where Klingons are concerned. <laughs> well, not really. It's not really been a, a, a huge length of time. Uh, it's been probably a couple of weeks. But what we are talking about today is we're sort of looking at the idea of show revivals. And I guess a, a number of things sort of brought this to mind. One is obviously that we've got uh, Star Trek Picard coming up, where we're going to kind of meet not only Jean-Luc Picard, but as we've found out, uh, you know, relatively recently, various other characters from Next Gen, Riker, Troy, Data, possibly, or, you, you know, some version of Data, at least, played by Brent Spiner, and indeed Jerry Ryan, uh, Seven of Nine from Star Trek Voyager. So we've got this uh new star trek coming uh in i guess you know pr- pretty pretty soonish they finished shooting the first season where we're going to kind of catch up with all those characters and it sort of got me thinking about the motion picture and the kind of first time that star trek sort of tried to do this and really what a radical idea that was at the time you know in 1979 to bring back this show that had been off the air for 10 years by that point and to try and i suppose I think one of the things maybe we'll talk about is, is how this plays out in the motion picture and then again how it plays out in The Wrath of Khan because in some ways I feel like The Wrath of Khan makes more mileage to some extent out, out of the, the, the time gap, sort of almost disregarding the motion picture. But we can kind of come on to that. But the way really that I suppose the Star Trek movies with the original series cast um, – make the most of the fact that time is passing, that there has been a kind of gap in time since the series and what that kind of allows them to do. In contrast to in the previous episode, uh, Chris Nunn and I were talking about generations and what that meant for the next gen cast kind of going straight from shooting their finale one week to literally shooting their first film the next week uh, and not really having any kind of passage of time in between. But what does it do to Star Trek to have these kind of huge gaps where uh, these characters kind of go away and they live on maybe in the novels or in our imagination um, and maybe at the conventions you see the actors kind of uh, gradually aging and so on and then suddenly those characters are back I mean we're used to seeing Marina Sirtis uh, at, at the Star Trek conventions but we haven't seen Deanna Troy since the end of Voyager oh that's not quite true we saw her very briefly uh, at the end of Enterprise I suppose but we haven't seen her for a while anyway and, and, and certainly many of these characters we haven't seen for some time and I think the motion picture in particular absolutely Absolutely capitalizes on the fact that you've not seen these characters for some time and really sort of plays on that and plays on the excitement of introducing them each you know almost one as i mean certainly kirk spock and mccoy each get their kind of big introductory 
scene in a way that, that, that they get the kind of big intro separately before we see them all together. And I think the film almost sort of relishes that. But really, I think you could say that Star Trek, and I'd be interested if, if you, Tony, or if any of our listeners can contradict me on this, but just off the top of my head, it seemed to me that Star Trek was maybe the first property to really to do this in such a major way to say, okay, there was this thing that finished 10 years ago, but we're good. You, you know, we know you still love it. Uh, we're going to bring it back and we're going to recognize that 10 years have, or at least that some number of years have passed and th- that something just because it's ended, that it's not necessarily dead forever. The idea that something can be revived. And obviously, you know, as we record in 2019, there's show revivals, film revivals, you know, pretty much everything seems to be either a reboot or a revival. And I suppose particularly it's the revivals I'm interested in, those ones where they do manage to get all the old actors back together, where they do manage to kind of, you know, catch up with those characters many years down the line. And and what it is about that that appeals to us so much, what kind of uh, opportunities that offers in a way for storytelling in a kind of slightly counterintuitive way in some ways because you might think that the you get to the end of the series or whatever and that's the end the book is closed and yet clearly there's an appetite for more yeah i mean the motion picture is interesting because i think i was as you said that then i was trying to think about whether there were other revivals that happened before that 1979 you're talking about for the motion picture now i can't off the top of my head i can't think of anything from the 50s or the 60s particularly that by that point were were, you had a sequel series or a movie revival or reboot or anything like that Uh, because they didn't really tend to do that very often at that point you know particularly in cinema you know you didn't really have many sequels except for certain different franchises say something like planet of the apes you you would have had you would have had quite a few And, and and it was mainly sort of horror or very B movie kind of franchises or comedy vehicles that in the historically had done sequels and they they almost weren't quite that the same thing as we know today. They didn't they they just used to rinse and repeat really a lot of the same characters, a lot of the same ideas. You never got the sense of a continuing story being told. And then the motion picture came along and then the Star Trek movies after that and yeah, I I I think it sort of changed the dynamic with that. And it was about the it was the fir- one of the first i think movies to really one of the first franchises to really recognize its own past you know because instead of what well, you know what they could have in theory done was you know do an entirely new star trek movie with an entirely new cast or entirely new crew and get all these a list actors you know and and everything to to headline this movie but they didn't they they brought back shatner uh, you know nimoy all these guys and they they did a sequel and they updated it to not just them as older characters, but you know, set in the, in a completely different, at the end of a very different decade to the 1960s. So you already had a very different flavor for what that movie was going to be. And I think it, it, it's, it's really interesting when you have a film birthed out of the idea of, of a revival. And remember this came out of the back of um, the much hyped Star Trek phase two, which was, the planned the first planned sequel series to Star Trek that Roddenberry was hoping to do towards the end of the seventies, a few years before you, the, the motion picture came to bear, and in that, in that, in fact, in that see, in that series, Spock wasn't going to be in it. It was he was going to be replaced by the actor David Gautreau playing a, a Vulcan called Zon, who I think ends up sort of very, very tangentially in the motion picture in like a cameo. Or the actor does, at least, playing a Vulcan. The actor does, yeah, I think so. And yeah. and so, you know, and, and Persis Kambata was going to be in the show as Ilea, and, you know, and, and, all, and all of these, a lot of this was parlayed, obviously, into the motion picture. And scripts were written for Phase 2, many of which were then used for the next generation, uh, quite, or a few of them were used for the next generation, anyway, or ideas were taken and carried over 10 years later for the next generation. So... It was it was a movie born out of unusual circumstances in that it was a movie ultimately born out of a failed sequel series. And again, that itself feels quite unusual in the sense that I think since that after before after that you had around a similar time you I think you had the Twilight Zone starting to come back and possibly as I don't know if it had come back as a series yet, but it had come back it was coming back as a movie. I think the movie was early eighties, but. Very little from the 60s, particularly, I think, had, had really come back as a series. So I, I think it's very interesting how motion picture is born out of 
a, a TV revival. And that is unusual. That is a very good point, I think, and, and something that maybe we don't tend to think about as much when we think of the motion picture, partly because the end result, I mean, whatever you think about the motion picture as a work of drama, it's very cinematic. It's very kind of big and grand and it's kind of filling the screen. It's, it's very much, it doesn't feel like it's been kind of cobbled together from, uh, so, <laughs> sort of, yeah. uh, you know, aborted TV series, no, no. basically. But I suppose there's an interesting question with phase two, you know, is that a revival? Is it a spin-off? I mean, obviously we're kind of used to Star Trek spin-offs. I, I think you're right though to call it a revival because other than Leonard Nimoy, uh, I think the entire cast were intending to return for phase two. So it's not like it's going to be a different enterprise, a different crew or anything. It is going to be Kirk and the crew of the enterprise. And there is going to be a Vulcan science officer. It's just not going to be Spock because Leonard Nimoy didn't want to do it. So you're right. That was in a sense a revival. You could argue that was the second revival because the animated series, of course, although aimed in some ways at a younger audience, you, you know, we call it the animated series. At the time, they called it Star Trek. That's what it, that's what comes up on the screen. You know, there was this idea kind of on on some level, this is the same show, sort of notionally, this is the same show that you're watching. And I suppose with phase two, they were sort of going in the same direction. And, and obviously then things, you know, conspired in, in various ways. And we ended up getting this cinematic franchise uh, instead. And I think probably for the long-term kind of longevity of, of Star Trek, probably that was, uh, I suspect, a, a very good thing. Although it is always sort of interesting to kind of speculate about what might have been. One of the things that struck me, though, when, you know, you were talking about the decision to bring back these actors, to bring back the 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 cast, albeit, you know, 10 years older, rather than recasting, having these kind of young hotshots or whatever. I mean, obviously, we did see that essentially in 2009. We finally got that reboot of the original series. But they had been talking about doing it for many years. I'm not sure how many uh, films into the uh, original series movies that this idea started being floated around. But this idea of a Starfleet Academy story where you were going to have the old, maybe the old Kirk, Spock and McCoy reminiscing and then younger actors taking over that role. Because at some point there was this sort of anxiety. Are they a bit past it for these kind of action roles? Are they kind of... Um, it, it, you know, is there going to need to be a kind of passing the torch and a passing the torch to a younger Kirk, Spock and McCoy that could be done, you, you, you know, and, and they were thinking about doing that, certainly, you know, when they were writing uh, Star Trek VI, for example. And absolutely, that is kind of what, in a sense, finally came to fruition, although in a rather different way, uh, when we got to J.J. Abrams' 2009 movie. Uh, and I suppose there is that kind of interesting dilemma, isn't there? You, you might think the kind of the standard thing to do, and, and partly this this comes down to a question of what Star Trek is. You know, is Star Trek this kind of action adventure show which does revolve around, you know, sort of young, kind of charismatic young hero heroes essentially uh, flying around in space, or can it be something different? And I suppose what the original series movies had to do was to take on board the fact that these characters were get, getting older, and particularly Kirk. And I think one of the great strengths of the original series movies is that they make an absolute asset of the fact that William Shatner is getting older, that Kirk is getting older, and the rest of the crew as well, to, to a lesser extent, but that Kirk's ageing really becomes part of the story. And partly that works because Kirk's youth is such an important aspect of his character in the original series. So then having him sort of lose that takes that character in kind of quite interesting directions. I mean, I would say that aspect of it is probably less obvious in the motion picture. I mean, in the motion picture, 10 years have passed in real time. Now, confusingly, I had to look this up because I hadn't really appreciated, but the chronology in universe of these these films is quite different. So actually in universe, uh, the amount of time that passes between the end of the five-year mission of the original series and the motion picture is only, I think, like three three or four years something like that not not a huge amount of time i mean kirk says he's been in this desk job basically for two and a half years and i think it not much more than that period of time is supposed to have passed so you do see the characters looking a bit older i mean you know scotty's grown his mustache he's kind of got gray there's, <laughs> there's a fair amount of gray hair going around you've got bones yeah. with his, his uh enormous beard. beard the beard always seems to be a kind of symbol <laughs> of time passing and of these characters kind of moving into their own world I, I was struck by the fact that in the x-files when they did the um 
I want to believe the second X Files movie, movie. which, which yeah. had some of these same things. You get David Duchovny with a big bushy beard at the beginning. It's almost <laughs> it's a, it's a sort of way of like signalling uh, somehow this is not the person you knew because they've got a beard. It's it's a kind of idea that a man grows a beard out of a sense of like personal psychological crisis somehow, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. I, you could say. Yeah. I mean, in in all good things, of course, you've got Picard with a beard, and interestingly, in the Picard yep. show, we're getting Picard without the beard. So whatever that's sort of supposed mm. to. Uh, signal to us in a way there, there is this sense that like Picard with the beard is, is yes it's Picard but it's not Picard whereas now we're getting you know <laughs> maybe this is kind of in some essential way Picard but anyway so you, you, you've got this yeah. sense of the the characters are aging to some extent but I don't feel that their age is is that there's all that much weight being put on it I mean Kirk has lost the Enterprise for kind of bureaucratic reasons, essentially. There's no sense that he's too old to command the Enterprise, really. Um, and he's very determined to get it back. In some ways, he feels very much like the same Captain Kirk we knew before. He's a little bit more bitter. Uh, he's obviously had a bit of a setback, but he, his personality sort of feels basically intact, I would say. He, he's not so much uh, in command of his own destiny. He's not so much this kind of captain with total freedom. We, we see him in a different context, but he feels like sort of recognisably the same person. By the time you get to the Wrath of Khan, he feels very different. This feels like someone who is is no longer, in some sense, the Captain Kirk that we sort of knew and loved. You know, that the time has really changed him. And that film, of course, absolutely emphasizes his age much more strongly and it does make sense actually when you look at the chronology um again i mean i'm just looking i'm going off wikipedia here but according to wikipedia the events of star trek the motion picture take place in 2273 and the events of the wrath of khan take place in 2285 so that's a 12 year gap and obviously we're supposed to understand there was another five-year mission and everything all this stuff happened in between that we never saw a 12-year gap on in universe and yet only what uh what is it like three year four year maybe gap um in terms of when the movies came out so there's this weird thing where the where the i mean why this came about exactly in the in the first instance when they bring star trek back there's been this huge gap this like decade long gap in the real world but they're trying to uh shrink that and say actually it's only been a few years in the star trek universe second time around they come to do it only a few years later and they're imagining a much bigger gap and suddenly you know time has really caught up with them we're no longer pretending that less time has passed than it has before and obviously with the picard series they've taken the decision pretty much to say one year in real time equals one year in screen time i suppose just as they did all the way through you know next gen ds9 voyager and so on but it's kind of interesting that that playing with time to some extent does affect how these films how the sort of story of the film ties in with the the reality of you know kind of life in the in the real world and for these actors who are, are coming back after a period of time i i think there's a couple of things with this i think the the first thing with the motion picture is that obviously you got to remember with the with this being the a revival essentially of star trek it was coming off the back of an entire decade where Star Trek never really went away for the fan base. There were the conventions, you know, it was, it, it sort of triggered, it started the whole convention circuit, you know, idea for fandom. You know, it was, it was in many ways one of the biggest first connected fandoms. And Star Trek never went away. And one of the reasons that Sp Nimoy didn't want to do phase two is that I think he felt like Spock had taken over his entire life, you know, and he had the really troubled period where well, I am not Spock and then I am Spock later on in his books, you know. And then he embraced it as he got older and got back into it and stuff like that. And obviously the lure of a movie is a completely different thing. You know, he's more likely to come back for a big screen adventure. But the, the, the point I'm trying to make is that with the motion picture, I think it was, it was a simple revival in that I think what they essentially wanted to do was create the Star Trek that you knew, but through A, a cinematic prism, and B, off the back of the fact that advances had been made in technology, that they had a bigger budget. And, you know, you've got to remember that not, end of the 70s, a lot of the science fiction around that time, it's just before you get a lot more of the colour and the joie de vivre that you, you then see later in a lot of the sci-fi franchises, particularly Star Wars, which had come out by this point, but you still had the tail end of things like, you know, the same year of of the motion picture is Alien. You've got Blade Runner soon on the horizon. So there's quite a lot of these quite cold science fiction films. And the motion picture is quite a cold distancing movie. You know, it doesn't have the the, the, the humanity and the warmth in many ways that 
um, the Wrath of Khan does, or, or subsequently. Now, or the, the don't get me wrong, I really like had, arguably. Well, all, all that the original series had. Now, don't get me wrong, I really like the motion picture, and I like it more with age, actually. But, I, I, but I think it, it, you have to appreciate that it was it was a, a creation of its time, particularly of its time, perhaps even more so than some of the films that followed it. And I think what they wanted to do was try and crystallise Star Trek and give it what that we knew, but update it, as it were, for that period of time. So it wasn't, it couldn't be the colourful camp of the 60s, because for lots of reasons that go beyond probably our discussion here, you know, about how the, se- the 70s have been a very, very different decade for American society, for cinema, you know, for all kinds of different things swirling around the ether. But I think that's why it kind of tries to package them as not having particularly aged much, even though physically they have, you know, they're 10 years older. And I think because the series didn't have a conclusion as such, you know, it was cancelled ultimately. So while the motion picture doesn't necessarily pick up on threads and if, and it does to some extent, try and place them in different parts of their life, you know, McCoy's gone off and grew grown a beard. Spock has been on Vulcan, you know, and Kirk's been promoted. So it, even in that short space of time, as you say, chronologically, a lot has happened to place them elsewhere. It doesn't feel like you're picking up lots of story threads from from the original series, where if you compare something like you mentioned earlier, The X-Files, that revival series, which had been, it had been 10 years since the movie, which itself had been five years since the TV series ended. So you're talking more like 15 years between story points, potentially, that had to work to recognise some of the lingering threads from the original series and then try and repurpose them and follow those up into the revival series. But things were a bit different back when this happened. But I think that's one of the reasons, you know, you talked about the Wrath of Khan. I think one of the reasons that by the point of the time you get to the Wrath of Khan, the, the the big time jump is strange in terms of the chronology of the show. It doesn't make much sense, but I think Nick Meyer wanted to re not if not reinvent Star Trek, then place it in a very very different context to what we'd seen before. And you know because he wanted to tap far more of that humanity. He wanted, and we've talked a lot about the Wrath of Khan on this podcast, and of course on Trek FM. But so I'm not going to go into all of that, what he's trying to do. But ultimately, the point being, he wanted to recognise that the characters had aged, particularly Kirk. And that was integral to the story in a way that it wasn't for the motion picture. And that's why they seem to differ in in a lot of ways, even though between them, there is like a three-year gap <laughs> in well, there's real a weird time. sense in some ways that the Wrath of Khan is almost a kind of soft reboot of the motion picture. I mean, there are kind of... Um, parallels between the two of them that they both sort of have to get everyone onto the enterprise into this situation they both have this kind of um moment of sort of meeting the ship again they 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 both have this kind of sense of picking up after a long gap and it does sort of feel in an odd way that it's almost the roth almost disregards that the motion picture ever happened somehow i think and it does absolutely it totally sells that idea of them aging i mean you know Right from the opening, you have got this sense of Kirk as this quite... If Kirk in the motion picture was a little bit jaded, here he's really quite cynical. He's got a kind of edge to him. He he has a kind of mean streak almost, you know, even in that Kobayashi Maru, the way he talks to Savick. Uh, and then you've got this line that he says to McCoy, gallivanting around the cosmos is a game for the young Doctor. I mean, that's the kind of real crux of the of that theme, you know, it sort of nails that theme very early on in the film, really. And then this idea, they keep talking about the enterprises being crewed by kids. You know, are these kids ready for, uh, what they're going to find out there? They, they're too, you know, they're, they're really supposed to be the ones kind of running the ship and the old enterprise crew are just there for an inspection and to kind of, um, you know, see how it goes. Now, ironically, people always complain, uh, with the 2009 movie. And I would put myself as one of the people who complain about the 2009 movie in this respect and, and particularly into darkness, I suppose that those movies seem to put this incredibly sophisticated piece of technology the enterprise uh, in the hands of a bunch of like of people in their early 20s do you know what i mean there, there is this sense of like surely these guys are too young to be a to hold those kind of ranks in any military structure and b to be in charge of something so powerful and so uh important as as this starship but i suppose there is that kind of sense that the rotha Khan almost kind of lays the groundwork for that in some ways. And I think in terms of pointing up Kirk's age, you know, it does it brilliantly. The fact that it's his birthday, the fact that, you know, he's clearly taking this birthday so badly. McCoy has that line, you know, 
other people have birthdays why do we have to treat yours like a funeral uh, giving him the reading <laughs> glasses is just an inspired decision i think because it it's it, it absolutely cuts against his kind of the old Kirk persona. And I suppose that's what the, the Star Trek movies from the Roth of Con onwards managed to do, sometimes for comedic effect, sometimes for slightly more dramatic effect, is to really chip away a little bit at the myth of Captain Kirk and, and to kind of show that this is a flawed real man in some ways and to make him feel more real. And that's one of the great strengths of those movies. At the same time, there is a sense, you know, uh, as you said, that the... The Wrath of Khan kind of returns us to the slightly earthier Star Trek. It returns us to the conflict, the Kirk, Spock, McCoy dynamic. There's much more kind of snappiness to it. I mean, uh, you've got that great line from McCoy about, you know, do you need a tranquilizer? You've got this, you've got this real wit coming off all these characters that does really hark back to the original series. I mean, interestingly, it struck me the fact that these films both in their own way sort of feel like an attempt to not just revive, but slightly reboot a sort of soft reboot of Star Trek in a way, in terms of like, what is, what is Star Trek going to be now? It is weirdly resonant of the fact that, of course, originally Star Trek had two pilots. You know, Star Trek had the first pilot that was supposedly too cerebral, that was, you know, too sophisticated for the audience. And then the second pilot that was more of an action adventure, a bit more of a romp. And with the movies, I mean, you wouldn't necessarily say that Wrath of Khan is exactly a romp, but it really cuts to the chase. It gets to the action. It's, you know, it hits all those kind of dramatic beats. It's, a very different beast to the motion picture, which is very kind of slow and stately and, and thoughtful, you know, and even opens with that kind of prelude, which is just a blank screen for like five minutes of, of this kind of beautiful elegiac music. A, a, a strange decision. I don't know if that was meant to sort of represent this 10 year gap somehow, but you've got the, the film literally opens with, with nothing for a long period of time on screen. <laughs> uh, and then suddenly kicks into this kind of thumping, you know, score, basically the kind of what we come to think of as the next generation score. But for the most part, that film is much more in the mood of that first theme of that kind of prelude of that kind of slow, stately, tone and in some ways there is a kind of parallel between that and the cage being thought to be you know not really having enough action not really having enough kind of um humanity in a sense and then what nick meyer does again is he sort of pulls the same trick that they pulled you know in 1966 of kind of saying well let's let's kind of slightly redo this attempt to reinvent star trek for the cinema and we're going to do almost exactly the same thing we did the first time around you can't help wondering as well is it something about gene roddenberry that you know gene roddenberry obviously wrote, you know, The Cage was kind of his first vision for Star Trek. The motion picture was kind of his vision for Star Trek as a motion picture. And then it sort of takes someone else to come in and say, okay, let's try something a little bit more with maybe a little bit more sort of mass market appeal, a little bit warmer somehow. And that's the one that really nails it somehow. And that's the one that kind of pulls in the crowds and, and keeps that franchise, you, you know, keeps it going and gives it that sort of longevity. Yeah, I think there's there's a lot to be said for that, you know, because he, I don't think Roddenberry would ever really have been able to make the film that Nicholas Meyer made, you know. But I'm really curious as we're talking about this to def sort of define what, in certainly in Star Trek terms, the difference is between a revival and a reboot, because I think I think they're two very different things. In that, I mean, I think the the the, the cage and like where no man has gone before is a really interesting kind of comparison because I think. In many in many ways, you could classify, or was it the Man Trap, which was which was the one they they did as the second sort of pilot, which even though the Man Trap aired first. Well, was the it, Man Trap was, was the first to be aired. The, where No Man Has Gone Before was the second pilot, in as far it as was. that was the one that they shot after the Cage. That's right. And then that's right. When I think that was green lit, they shot the rest of they started making the rest of the series, and by the time it came to broadcast, they had. I think like a sort of handful of episodes and someone picked the man trap as the one to broadcast the first. Uh, because I guess That's in those right. days there was no, there was no pilot in the sense of, you know, next gen DS9 yeah, Voyager, you exactly. have to get the crew together. The, the pilot has to sort of serve this function of um, sort of setting the scene and, and laying everything out. Whereas really, you, you know, with that kind of earlier form of episodic TV, like truly episodic TV where you could, really watch any episode in any order that that wasn't really a consideration it was just what, what's the best episode to stick out there that's going to make people tune in again next week yeah it was, a, it was a simpler time in terms of the way yeah these things were constructed but so even though even though it wasn't as you as we as you just say absolutely rightly a pilot as such it was it was the second go 
it was that they there were things in the cage, you know, principally Pike. You know, they wanted they wanted a different man in the in the chair um, and swapping around and adding cast members and things like that. So I would classify the the Kirk onwards, you know, original series stuff as the reboot of the cage. You know, in 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 essence, and and by that definition, you know, the J.J. Abrams films are a a reboot as they've always been called because they go back to the original idea and they do it in a different way. Whereas and with I different think, actors, crucial. I mean, I think that's the, with, like on the most yeah. basic sort of prosaic level. That's the that's the kind of big distinction I'd say for the average punter in a sense. Yeah, and that, and that I suppose that's why it was it was unusual in some senses for the cage and where no man has gone before, etc. Because you did retain Leonard Nimoy, and I think it was one of those things where they knew he he and Spock were a good character and it was a case of porting him in, you know, and, and, and not worrying too much about it, but you're absolutely right. It is primarily the act, the actors. And I think that's probably the answer to the question. Whereas revivals are all about recapturing that spirit. That's those same actors, the same kind of, you know, charisma that, that appealed in the first place. And that's why I think, you know, we, 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 we've been on a real revival kick over the last few years on TV, particularly, um, cause I, I feel like it, it, TV is more the domain for the revival, whereas the reboot tends to happen more at the cinema. You don't tend to get too many, I, I think, off the top of my head, revivals as such. I mean, probably one of the most famous, one of the, one of the biggest was The Force Awakens, you know, because I think you could, you could classify that as a revival and in some respects a reboot in a way. You know, it's sort of a hybrid of both, you know, in that it's, it's pick, it's taking the, the classic actors that you know, and it's adding new ones into the mix. So that's an unusual beast. But I don't think you tend to get too many revivals in the cinema. Quite often they will take a concept, take an old series, take an old idea, an old movie, and they'll give it the reboot treatment. Something like Ghostbusters, for instance, with the all-female Ghostbusters. That's a, that's a classic idea of a reboot. Whereas in TV, and as I say, The X-Files is a good example, there's, there's been loads lately. Things like Prison Break, Gilmore Girls... Um, you've got Gossip Girl coming up. All these old series. There's always talk about a Buffy, the Vampire Slayer revival. These are mostly I have so to say, shows I was barely aware of them coming and going the first time round. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, yeah, you're right. You're right. There is absolutely a massive yeah. revival culture, and I think the X Files revival was probably a, a, a real sort of um, high watermark in, in some ways of that. And obviously, that is part of the context that Star Trek Picard comes out of. I mean, I was always very concerned for years. They were. All this talk about, you know, are they going to reboot Next Generation like they rebooted the original series? And I just thought, oh, God, this is going to be grim. You know, who, someone else is going to have to play Data. Yeah. And, uh, you know, how, how is all of this going <laughs> to work somehow? Whether, whether Whatever your feelings about the 2009 reboot and what, what they recaptured and what they didn't and so on. But I think it's interesting. I mean, J.J. Abrams is an interesting example because obviously he did both the Star Wars and the Star Trek uh I feel we need a third word. You, 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 the return of both those franchises, in a sense. Yeah. <laughs> Why is it yeah. that he revived Star Wars and rebooted Star Trek? I mean, that's sort of an interesting question. Is it partly because of the age? I mean, but, but I suppose on a practical level, it would be it was too late to revive Star Trek again by that point because many of the original series cast were no longer around. Uh, whereas Star Wars was kind of just at this point where. You know, sadly, obviously, Carrie Fisher died before they finished that kind of uh, revival trilogy. But the, but all the cast was still available and still, you, you know, w- willing one way or another. But I think it's kind of interesting, you know, what why the revival for one franchise and the reboot treatment for the other, and what does that kind of what, what sort of an impact does that have? What does it do? You know, what does that do for the fans? I mean, in some ways, a revival you could say is more geared towards some form of fan service you, you know the idea that the, the idea of nostalgia in a sense whereas the reboot so the 2009 star trek reboot it does kind of play it plays on i'd say it plays on nostalgia for the original series in a kind of aesthetic sense it plays on a kind of nostalgia for some kind of loose idea of what star trek might be but it doesn't really play on any kind of nostalgia for what star trek actually is in a certain way. Do you, do you know what I mean? It, it pl- plays to a much more general idea of Star Trek as a kind of concept rather than Star Trek as those actual, you know, however many episodes, films, etc. And it's very different from the way the original series approached it, which was much more, you know, digging into the kind of humanity of these characters, digging into the kind of nitty gritty of these characters. 
and sort of not trying to recapture schematically or, or in some kind of very straightforward way, like the colour scheme and the kind of look of the original series, but trying to say, okay, what is it that we love about Star Trek? Well, we love, you know, Kirk and Spock and McCoy and, you, you know, all these characters and the kind of interactions between them. And actually we can make those things work, even though these actors are, you know, ageing in real time, that's not necessarily going to work against it. I mean, for my mind, the revivals are always that they appeal to me more. I mean, I, I don't have anything against the, I, I didn't see the Ghostbusters reboot. I don't, I, it, it doesn't bother me or anything, but I mean, like the, w- when they reboot things, my initial reaction is kind of, if I loved the original one, I mean, there was talk recently about rebooting Princess Bride and everyone was sort of up in arms. A revival has more of an appeal to me. So Bill and Ted, we're going to get a Bill and Ted revival. I'm definitely going to go and see that one because I remember Bill and Ted from back in the day and, you know, loved them as a kid. And, and that, that, that means something. A, re- a reboot of Bill and Ted, I would just, I couldn't care less. Do you know what I mean? So I think there is something, and maybe nostalgia is not the best way to, to lure punters into the cinema, but it's obviously a very powerful way. And I sort of think if you're, if you're not coming up with anything new, if all, if not that this is all that comes out of Hollywood or whatever, but if a lot of what you're producing is one way or another harking back to these previous things, to my mind, at least a revival forces you to make certain changes. It forces you to think, okay, what's happened in the meantime? What, 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 what does this gap mean? We can't just pick up exactly where we left off. Although interestingly, I suppose with the X-Files, you could say, there's this weird thing that I think with a lot of these stories, you, you have these characters who have to be, as you said, in the motion picture, the characters have to be dispersed. So although a lot of the Enterprise crew are back on the bridge, Kirk, Spock and McCoy are none of them in their kind of correct places. They all have to sort of be reassembled. Uh, with the X-Files, you get this sense that both in that movie, I want to believe, and then again in the revival series, uh, they're not working on the, you know, it's called the X-Files, but they're not working on the X-Files. They're kind of out in the cold. You know, Mulder is kind of, festering with his conspiracy theories and growing a beard scully is doing her best <laughs> to forget the x-files and and one of the things yeah. i loved about that for that film i want to believe is this sense of it really being scully's story of her being sort of sucked back into this dark world that she's tried to leave behind her but then when you come to the revival the two revival series of the x-files in recent years they quite quickly got them kind of back on the inside so there's this kind of these sense are they are they on the outside or are they on the inside and you get that with all the star trek original series movies you know are they just on this ship because they happen to be there when something happened and then they're kind of stuck there for a bit are they actually going to get given are they actually going to be you know given the kind of authority to take those roles officially and it sort of comes and goes throughout those movies again and again but, but i think that kind of plays into it you know how do we get these we've got these actors back, but how do we get these characters back into sort of doing the same thing? And, and is it realistic to say that they're doing exactly the same thing or do we have to kind of almost find a sort of segue to get them in there? Yeah. And, and I think that's a, that's a common thing for every single revival. And I think it's one of those things with, you know, the Abrams comparison with Star Trek and Star Wars. I think, I think going back to what you said about his reasons, I think one of the main reasons from what I've read that he did them differently is because he enjoyed Star Trek when he was a child, but he was a massive fan of Star Wars and he was really invested in that world to the point he wanted to see Luke Skywalker, Han Solo, Princess Leia back. He didn't want just Ray, Finn, Poe and start again, or he didn't want to, to redo the original trilogy and have younger versions of Han Solo. And I mean, arguably when they did the solo spin-off film, you know, with a younger Han Solo, it didn't really take, you know, people weren't really that interested because it wasn't Harrison Ford. And I think that's part of the, part of the key to why the, 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 I mean, the very, very divisive sequel trilogy for Star, Star Wars so far. And obviously the rise of the Skywalker is coming in a matter of months to finish it off, but it's, it's, it's split people down the middle to some extent in terms of how they've received it. And I think, Personally, I think that, and J.J. Abrams is obviously back doing the last film, but I think that people will warm a lot more to what that trilogy has done in time because I think what it what it does do is play on nostalgia. And I think nostalgia is key. You know, I think it really is important to all this. I think it was important to the reboot of 09 because while it was very, very clearly a film that was geared towards trying to get in a new audience... At the same time, it wasn't. At the same time, it was all about appealing to the original fans. You know, that's why you had Leonard Nimoy in it. You know, that's why they, they, they didn't just do a completely different universe 
they they worked hard to tie it into the continuity as best they could of the original you know timeline of the show and that is to me a sign that abram's kind of wanted to have his cake and eat it in some respects he wasn't it wasn't a revival in the same sense that the star wars force awakens was but it was a it was it did have elements of revival in it you know that's why you had old spock that's why you had you know in in um into darkness you have you have very clearly its own take on the wrath of khan to the point that it mirrors the key scene at the very end of wrath of khan with spock in the chamber you know it flips it round on the other side then beyond you've got the the, the the whole subplot of of old Spock dying, having Leonard Nimoy having passed away, and that that amazing m- moment, which always gives me goosebumps, when he opens the box and he, you get the old picture of the original series crew from the original actors, and that that is that I remember thinking, obviously it was a tie into the fiftieth anniversary as well, wasn't it? But I remember look, thinking that I, I got goosebumps when that when I watched that on on the big screen for the first time, I got goosebumps. I was like, I love that kind of thing. I love that from a, a nostalgic point of view that Star Trek might be going off in this entirely you know new universe essentially but it hasn't forgot its past so they even though they're called a reboot they're kind of a bit of a a, a, of a revival as well they kind of want to have one foot in the nostalgia and the comfortability of what we know to star trek to be if anything i would say something like discovery is more of a distinct you know right turn away from what we know you know given given some of the paths that's gone down picard is much more of a revival but Discovery, if anything, is more of a reboot in in some ways than the the original series, uh, the J.J. Abrams films. If you want to term it in that kind of way, Discovery has really tried to sort of... <laughs> yes, it's set in the original series timeline, and there are certain ties into the original series, but that has gone with so many different ideas that in many ways contradict continuity, contradict canon. And I, you know, I've, I've, st- I've said on this podcast, I'm not the biggest fan of it, really, and, and where it's gone, because I think, I don't think Discovery does always respect its own history, and I think that's part of the reason why I've got a bit of a fractured relationship with. Not, I certainly am not. I'm not the only one I know. And I think, I think Picard will be far received in a far easier way, and and it will be more, regardless of where it goes. There, there are a lot of elements of revival that it seems to be in that show. Because because it, it can go it can go either way. You know, you mentioned the X Files as well. That has really divided people. You know, there are there are a lot of people who hated what that what that those two seasons did that when it, after it came back after all that time. You know, it because yes, it did tie it does tie into the original run. It does bring back characters, but at the same time, it completely upends a lot of that mythology, a lot of that continuity. It changes things. It retcons. You know, it is not. It is and it isn't the same show, you know, and there are mixed, all kinds of mixed feelings about whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, go and listen to a podcast called The X-Cast if you want more uh, <laughs> on that name, blatant sort of promotion there. But that's the point, okay? It, it's it, Revivals can be a really divisive thing because it, it depends where you go with them, what you do with them. And that's why it's a really interesting question as to whether or not you reboot something completely or... Or you revive it, and what in in essence that means, particularly. And with I think Star there's Trek. also a sort of question of who are you serving when you're doing that job of of reviving that property? Because when they first announced the Picard series, they were very keen to say this is Jean Luc Picard. This is not a next generation revival we're not going to see the enterprise necessarily i mean maybe we are but you, you know we're mm. not necessarily yeah. we're not going to get the whole crew back together it's not going to be i mean ironically all good things kind of did the revival thing within the span of the show because they managed to do the episode where everyone is you know 20 years older getting the gang back together again within the scope of the show so we see all these kind of old uh, you know, curmudgeonly uh, characters that that we knew and loved, uh, e- even though you know the previous week they were, and even in the other scenes in that episode, they were kind of as we ever knew them. We we see that storyline played out kind of within the show itself, which was a a kind of very bold move, but in some ways I think slightly 
I don't know if it tied their hands exactly, but I think the combination of the fact that they did that in their finale and then that the movies went, came straight away and therefore the characters didn't age all that much, uh, in the course of the next gen movies over those years. Although obviously, you know, you could see they were, they were aging a certain amount, but certainly not relative to the original series. It meant that they kind of couldn't pull that trick again. Now with Picard, they sort of have the opportunity to do it. And interestingly, we have been getting all these announcements of, oh, you know, Marina Sirtis and Jonathan Frakes are going to be in it and kind of feels like almost everyone uh, is going to be in it eventually. And there's that interesting tension between you sort of wonder, you know, the writer who obviously has a kind of vision for what this show's about, and it's all about Picard, it's not about the next generation uh, crew. And then the fact that the fans want to see, you, you know, by now when we've got to the point where there's only like three of them i think who aren't going to be in it people are you know the people who love Worf are like where the hell is Worf?" the people who love beverly are like where the hell is beverly do you know what i mean the people who love geordie are saying where the hell is geordie um and you've got that kind of pressure in a sense and it in some ways it reminds me a little bit of um with better call saul uh which was the kind of spin-off of um breaking bad there was a lot of pressure there to sort of say wh- when are the cameo you, you, you know what how many cameos are they going to be and what are the cameos going to do and so on and i actually think i love that i mean i love breaking bad and i love better call saul and i think that the cameos and stuff that are in there work fine but fairly quickly if you were watching that show you realize this show is its own beast it's not actually going to be enhanced by constant kind of I was going to yeah. say name dropping. It's not quite name like face dropping effectively by dropping these other characters in it. And so often that doesn't work. I mean, when Frasier started, you know, Frasier being a reboot of Cheers, they started bringing in all these Cheers characters and the episodes with the Cheers characters for me. And maybe this is because I was, you know, I, I enjoyed Cheers, but I was never a huge fan. I, I absolutely loved Frasier, but the episodes with the Cheers characters were never the best Frasier episodes, if you know what I mean, because they felt like they were slightly a sop to you know, whether it's fan service or whether it's nostalgia or whatever it is, it wasn't necessarily serving the actual story that that show was supposed to be about. So I think it'll be interesting. I mean, and I feel conflicted about it because I'm thrilled we're going to get to see uh, Riker and Troy uh, together again. Uh, I'm interested and intrigued to find out what's going to happen with Data because that's kind of a big lingering question. I'm quite excited to see Seven of Nine, which I never had thought we'd see Seven of Nine again. Um, But I think that will be really interesting because there's a character who that period of time having passed clearly is going to have changed her quite um, dramatically. And I saw someone saying uh, recently that they're, they're great, that they're, kind of gratitude towards the Picard series was very much bound up in the idea that we could now have the character of Seven of Nine in an era where Star Trek is not kind of bound by these quite sort of sexist uh, tropes to do with. I mean, if you think of like the way she was dressed, I mean, that's one of the things that struck me when she turned up in the trailer was like, oh, wow, Seven of Nine's got a kind of normal wardrobe for the first time. (laughs) Um, And, you know, what they can do with that character when they're not also trying to make her into a sex object at the same time, that that is a real kind of opportunity uh, and sometimes these kind of revivals do oper- offer an opportunity to um, not redeem necessarily, but to find other elements in a character. I mean, the Voyager novels, for example, uh, a lot of people loved. And I mean, I don't want to get t- t- too diverted into the kind of novel verse, because that's another huge topic. But for example, the character of Chakotay, who a lot of people felt wasn't very well served by the writers on the show itself, uh, many people have felt that um, in the Voyager kind of continuation novels, that character is given a lot more to doing, is given a lot more depth. So I suppose there are, there are opportunities in some ways to redress certain kinds of imbalances when you do this. And when you bring characters back, you know, yes, you are playing on the nostalgia for who they were before. And, you, you know, yes, if it's the X-Files, we want to have Mulder and Scully back together again. That's the key thing, especially because in the X-Files, you know, there were seasons where Mulder and Scully were not together again. Do you know what I mean? Like that that had been, mm, uh, mm. even while the show was still kind of trundling on endlessly, that dynamic had kind of been lost. So there are certain things like that that we want to get back together again. But at the same time, you know, maybe it's it's good when these things surprise us as well. I mean, maybe it will be good if the characters who come back in Picard are not exactly who we remember them to be. I don't know. I feel conflicted about it because the, my, the, like my inner sort of 12 year old next gen fan will be horrified <laughs> uh, if, <laughs> and really struggle with it. If it's, <laughs> if it's kind of pushing too hard against that nostalgia at the same time, creatively, I kind of recognize that to just wallow in that kind of nostalgia would be very dangerous. And I think it's good that it seems like the show has 
a kind of vision of its own and it has a sense of you know whatever the story is that it's telling it has it has got a sense of it seems like they've got a plan for picard and an interesting storyline in mind for picard and you know what the, what role these other characters play will remain to be seen but hopefully it's not just going to be a kind of roster of of guest stars if you know what i mean yeah yeah and and this is this is where I go, just going back to Discovery, this is where I am a bit conflicted and a bit torn because, on the one hand, much as I, you know, like I say, I, I've not always enjoyed some of the fact it's really, pla- you know, played and, and I think inverted and twisted some of the Star Trek ideas. At the same time, that first season, I really don't care much for the second for many reasons I've stated before, but the the first at least does try and do new things within the within the box of the continuity that it is holding to, you know, and if it had been more consistent in the approach and if it had been a little bit better worked out, I think it would have been a much stronger framework for the whole thing. But unfortunately, it's just a bit too inconsistent to really hold together. But I think it's whether it it comes down to the whole thing of whether or not you, you, when you do a revival in something like Star Trek, whether you're reviving a franchise or whether you're reviving elements of a franchise, you know, with Picard, uh, you know, you're, you're reviving not just the next generation, but Voyager, elements of Voyager. I mean, I, I'd be astonished if we don't see Catherine Janeway at some point in Picard. You know, I mean, there's, there's already rumours that we're going to see Worf, you know, and they're keeping that quiet on the down low. I'm sure lots of them will end up If we don't see Worf, Michael back. Dorn is going to be on the warpath. I mean, <laughs> he's been lobbying yeah, harder I mean, than anyone uh, for years. He wants absolutely. his captain. Worf. And if Worf isn't a captain, you know, <laughs> I don't know yeah. what will happen. I think, I think it's... It's a guarantee, even if not this season, then the next season. You know, there's been talks that there that, that Robert Picardo has been approached to play the EMH again. You know, and there's all this kind of thing. So it's well, it's though in this case you're reviving characters from two shows that you know th- in in theory were essentially the same concept. You know, Next Generation and Voyager were the same show in many ways. It just happened that Voyager was lost in a different part of the galaxy. And part of the criticism of Voyager from a lot of people over the years, particularly Ron Moore in some of his fantastic interviews, is that Voyager just tried to be Next Gen except in the Delta Quadrant. So they, you know, they did have a lot of shared sort of DNA. So it kind of makes sense to sort of weld those together when it comes to a, a revival show 20 years on. Whereas when you're looking at something like, you know, in comparison with the motion picture, going back to that, when you're trying to revive the concept of Star Trek, that's when it gets a little bit different. And, and particularly with the with the reboot, you know, the J.J. Abrams reboot, you're, you, you have to do it differently because you're reviving an idea. And I think, you know, you couldn't have made... J.J. Abrams could not have made the same films that Nicholas Meyer and Leonard Nimoy and Shatner made in the 80s. They, it would be impossible because they were, made, they were very of their time, you know, and, and equally, you know, when you're, re, when you're reviving, you're rebooting a franchise, you have to adhere to, you know, the, 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 the age you're reviving these things in. That's one of the reasons that Picard is going to be a 10 part, you know, serialized story. It's not, you know, in the old days of, of the 90s Star Trek paradigm of, you know, different individual episodes. It's not Picard back on the Enterprise, as you say. It's not, it's not back on a ship in the same way. It's, it's an ongoing plot that will play out in serialized, in a serialized way. And I think that's, that's one of the things when you revive something. And it, and again, that was one of the reasons that the X-Files one divided a lot of people because it kind of tried to do exactly what the old show had done. It, it, it tried to do exactly the same kind of, um, structure, you know, the individual X file stories, the overarching mythology episodes, and a lot of people were arguing. Well, actually, it looks old hat now. Well, it, it just feels old hat. It used feels very boldly. I think the old, uh, you know, title sequence. Which the old, I, and, title and I can sequence. sort of understand that because that title sequence is so iconic and it's so much of what people associate with yeah, the exactly. X yeah. But at the same time, it's also very kind of nineties, and I feel that was a very. Yeah. Um, I mean, that, it, almost a bit like, well, in, in Discovery, there was that episode where they, they did a kind of previously on Star Trek uh, sort of montage and used stuff from the yeah. cage and so on. Um, yeah, I like that, I quite actually. liked it. I quite enjoyed it. I mean, as much as we, yeah, you know, we did. both have criticised some of the kind of nostalgic elements of season two of Discovery. I quite, I yeah. quite appreciated that. But I think for the X-Files to say, right, we're coming back in 20, whatever it was, 2017 or it must have been whenever they recently, yeah, basically, 2016. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and we're doing this modern version of the show and yet somehow the trappings of the show are all literally unchanged from what they were 20 odd years ago. Um, was a very, 
bold move and very different in some ways. I mean, I think the X-Files is an interesting comparison for Star Trek. Um, not just because I happen to have you on the show this uh, episode, but also because, you know, when you think about the Star Trek movies, I mean, the previous episode of Primitive Culture uh, was looking at generations and we were comparing that to some degree to the X-Files, the first X-Files movie, Fight the Future, insofar as that was a, a movie that came, you know, not only immediately following but actually within the series continuity so it was a movie that kind of fitted with no time gap whatsoever that was kind of trying to slot right in and then obviously the x-files did this second movie uh which was very much playing a bit like the motion picture on a kind of period of time having passed and everyone's in a new situation scully's got a new job everyone's kind of got a new life um and and kind of you know sort of doing that sort of uh story in a way i mean maybe the thing about the revival series is that they do get them back into the X-Files and sort of back on the inside quite sort of implausibly quickly, I think, for these two people who have so demonstrably moved or at least attempted to move on with their... Well, I know Mulder hasn't really moved on with his life, but uh, it, it feels... <laughs> it, given that so much of the TV show, the X-Files, was about them sort of being pushed out and people trying to kind of push them out of the X-Files, it's surprising that they kind of get brought back in so quickly and then suddenly yeah. they've just picked up their... I mean, as if anyone in the real world picks up a job that they did like 20 years ago or something <laughs> suddenly because, you know, someone said, oh, we need you back, yeah. you know, we need you back. But at the same time, part of the formula of that show is that you need to have Mulder and Scully investigating these cases. So you do sort of need to have them, you need to have the kind of mechanism and the resources of the X-Files. And I guess with Star Trek, similarly, you know, with the original series movies, you need to get all of those characters onto the Enterprise each time, even though they've left the Enterprise and they're, in some cases, they're retired or if they're not retired, they're at least doing a desk job or whatever. So you need to sort of justify how are they, why are they all together and why are they all there somehow? Now in the Picard series, it's going to be a bit different, I think, because, uh, you, you know, I don't know, it looks like he's sort of chartering some ship that he needs to get him somewhere or whatever and he's maybe going to encounter people along the way. But it's not so much that sense of trying to, get all the gang back together uh because as i said they've kind of already done that um in all good things and this is the sort of alternate version of like future picard story uh that, that, that we're going to kind of get playing out for real it's easy to forget though with the original series movies that they do end up doing a different thing than than the show ever would have done in the sense that you know, from the end, from the end of the Wrath of Khan onwards, it takes th two movies to get them back to the point where they're in more of the traditional, you know, let's go and explore adventure mode. You know, the, 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 the search for Spark and the, and the voyage home completely upend what the, sh what the show itself was. You know, so you, 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 it's between two and it's two and then five, which is, and even two in itself isn't really traditional. You know, it's not conventional because it's, it's them going after, you know, a complete lunatic madman. It's not the same, you know, whereas it's only really the final frontier that then has more of a, in some senses, a conventional, but even that, even that though, I don't think any of the original series films maybe with the exception of the motion picture, actually do hold true to a conventional, the Enterprise out doing what it normally does plot. And I think that is something people always forget in that they, it never really, you know, the next generation is far more um, in line with that. You know, like the insurrection particularly could have been a two part next generation episode of the, of the show really, you know, and, and you, but I don't think you ever really get that with the original no, series you, movies. You don't, you're right. I mean, they, they have the benefit that because three of the movies are kind of linked in so far as they lead one into the other, mm. uh, they literally just pick up where the previous movie left off. So you kind of don't have to, you don't have to keep getting them back together that time around. Um, we, we sort of have to gather them all in the first movie. We kind of have a justification for gathering them all in the second movie and that they're just, they seem to be in the wrong place at the wrong time on that mission, essentially. Uh, and then in, start, by the time you get to Star Trek six, again, they've sort of all been gathered together because there's this sort of notion that these are the, that they're going to be appropriate. Uh, th this retired crew is going to kind of be appropriate for that mission. But I think there is an interesting sort of element there of the, the sort of pleasure that is taken in reintroducing these characters, not only in gathering the group together, but in kind of reintroducing each character one at a time. And in the motion picture, the way it's written, I mean, one of the reasons that 
people always complain about how long and slow that film is, is it does really take its time to do one thing at a time. So, you know, so we get this sense that all these characters sort of need to be introduced separately to some extent. Um, maybe not so much Ahura and Chekhov and Sulu and so on, but the, the kind of core characters need to get their own introductions. So Spock gets his own introduction on Vulcan. We find out what he's been doing these past few years. Uh, when McCoy is introduced, we sort of find out that he's left Starfleet, that he's kind of gone off and, and you know, in this kind of Fox Mulder way, grown a beard and, and is, is, is doing his own thing and trying to leave his uh, sort of starfaring past behind him. Uh, Kirk is in his new position he's been changed as well he's in this kind of desk job or whatever and of course then the the big introduction of the film really the the biggest reintroduction that the film makes is of the enterprise and if you think you know each one of those characters gets a scene introducing them which they do uh the enterprise gets this you know monumental sort of piece of of cinema essentially this scene that is so overextended that it becomes a kind of laughing stock these days you you, you know it's hard to take it seriously because it goes on and on and on and on because this kind of reintroduction to the enterprise and obviously it's been souped up it's the refit it's you, you know it looks a bit different and so on it's on the big screen is such a key moment in the film and the film absolutely relishes giving us this you know the score relishes it the way it's shot and edited everything about it is set to kind of make this the big this is almost the climax of the film not all the stuff with Vija, which it takes forever to actually get to the climax of that film essentially is this moment where we get to see the enterprise and we get to go round and round and round and round and look at it and look at it a bit more and just sort of gulp at it to the extent that there's even that weird the way it's edited there's that weird moment at the end where when this long sequence with this beautiful score and everything finally comes to an end kirk says thank you mr scott as if we've just witnessed <laughs> like a performance by an orchestra or something it sort of it feels yeah. almost like it's been almost constructed for the audience to be like on their feet applauding mm. at that point or something it's a really weird yeah. moment it almost takes you out of the reality of the film because it's so it feels kind of stagey it feels kind of artificial and yet at the same time for that audience going to the cinema going back to see star trek for the first time after that period of uh, you know sort of 10 years off the air the excitement of seeing that ship again symbolically is it almost sort of stands in for the entire experience so i suppose you've got that kind of quality you don't really get that with the X Files, I think. I don't. I don't think the the X Files basement in the X Files has quite the same kind of visual, no. sentimental cachet that the Enterprise does in Star Trek. And in some ways, that's that's the character that gets the real star billing in that film in the way that it's reintroduced after this period of absence. Yeah, it, there's 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 an iconography about the whole thing. There's a there's something about that what it represents, I think, and what it sort of and its place within popular culture in in the way that a lot of these are there. But then, you, then you would there would be certain shows and certain revivals and reboots that would that would and do have particular you know visual elements or you know certain whether it's vehicles, places that have that aspect to them that you're as excited to see those as you are the characters and i think in some cases even more so you know even you, you might be even more excited to see those those, those those visual elements but i think with star trek it's it's kind of a mixture of both i mean if if we do end up seeing a future enterprise in picard or even the enterprise e you know if it's still going I think people are going to lose their minds. You know, it, it's re it's really going to be a moment that I, I imagine as well that they would really play. You know, a bit like how at the end of Discovery season one we saw the Enterprise. You know, Pike's Enterprise, and it gets its own little introduction with the theme as well. And it's 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 such a powerful image. It ends an entire season. You know, you're ended. You've ended with the Enterprise showing up. You don't even need to see who's on it. It doesn't really matter. You know, oh my God, it's the Enterprise. So I think when you're bringing a lot of these elements back with star trek you're bringing back more than just a character you're bringing back more than just a setting or a concept you're bringing back a universe you're bringing back a, a feeling you're bringing back an experience and it, and there has been pushback amongst fandom i think because it's changed that experience has changed there are people who dislike the reboots because they don't really feel in line with what star trek used to be and i like them but i completely understand that thought process it's the same with kind of some of the aspects of discovery which is which is 
much as it, I don't like I say, I don't think it all completely works. It does at least try and update the paradigm of Star Trek into the into the modern aesthetic of television. And I think you will find similar with Picard, even though it will be more nostalgic and retrospective. So I think that's what you have to factor in, and that's where it differs from a stock reboot. You will never completely stock reboot Star Trek. I think it will always end up being revived in some respect. It's just ha- the way it happens will, will ebb and flow and it will tweak. But I don't think you'll ever get a Star Trek series, ever, that doesn't in some way, somehow, somewhere, look back on its and own And maybe the history. Enterprise is, is almost a core kind of symbol of that because you could argue, I mean, the, the Enterprise in the motion picture is supposedly the same ship refitted. In fact, we know it's much, much bigger. There's this kind of sense of, does this really make sense? The Enterprise is also, is not just one ship, it's many ships. I mean, the Enterprise in the next generation is, of course, a completely different ship from the Enterprise in the original series. But the fact that we keep having these ships called Enterprise and that we care about these ships called Enterprise, and we don't have to have them, you know, we can have Voyager, we can have Deep Space Nine, we can have Star Trek without an Enterprise. But, you know, it's such a core part of what Star Trek represents somehow, there's this sort of interesting question. Every time the Enterprise comes back, you know, we're saying, is Captain Kirk the same character in The Wrath of Khan as he was in the original series? Well, is the Enterprise the same character? And I think the answer is yes. The Enterprise Mm. can have a facelift. Mm. It can look completely different. It can kind of be twice as big. Somehow it's always... It's being revived. It's coming back. It's the same character kind of reappearing, making this grand re-entrance onto the stage one way or another. And there's that strange sense that it, it in itself kind of provides that continuity. Um, I mean, we saw that in the finale of, of Enterprise, the TV show. One of the few moments, I think, where they absolutely hit the note that they were going for in that episode is right at the very, very end, where they have those voiceovers kind of um, blending into each other and they have those three Enterprises standing in for the kind of continuity of Star Trek going through time. That ship is the kind of iconic link in some ways, that does it right from the beginning through to the reboots, through to the, you know, everything. A good example of that in a different franchise, I think, is the Millennium Falcon in Star Wars. Right, yeah, because yeah. I've, I've, because the moment you they bring that back for the original trilogy, it's that great moment in The Force Awakens where everything's going wrong and the characters are running away and they happen to just randomly point at a ship and go, that one, we'll have that one. And it's the Millennium Falcon. And the cheer that got in the way that was reintroduced was bigger than anything else in that film when on the opening night when we all went to see it. Seeing the Falcon again was was it just blew people's minds. The way it was in, brilliantly reintroduced. And I think, you know, one of the reasons that that the, the prequel series the prequel films for Star Wars were lacking was because you didn't have that symbol. You know, that that wasn't in there. It was pre the Millennium Falcon and there was just something missing. There's an element of magic you know, that isn't there when you, when you, and it's the same with Star Trek, you know, much as there have been some amazing things like Deep Space Nine, you know, that had, didn't have an Enterprise in it. It's never quite the same. It's never quite the same when you don't have that ship. When you do, it just distills what this show is and what the franchise is just a Absolutely. little bit more. Well, I mean, arguably, maybe that's partly also because it's the one thing that doesn't age. I mean, the actors all get older, you know, yeah. some of the actors, you know, might not be around anymore. I mean, you know, that kind of aspect of the reality, the kind of real world um, situation of the production of Star Trek is almost inescapable. The Enterprise doesn't have to age. Do you know what I mean? It can change. It can it can mm. come back in different forms and so on. But somehow, yeah. I never really bought it. You know, when in the movies, they sort of say, oh, this old ship needs, you know, this kind of rust bucket is going to be, uh, you know mothballed or whatever i never really bought that because it never looks anything other than no. gleaming and state-of-the-art <laughs> and kind of perfect do you know what i mean and that's yeah. part of the aesthetic of yeah. star trek i think is that that ship always has that kind of quality and it, there is a nostalgic element but there's also a kind of it's almost sort of eternal do you know what i mean because it it, it doesn't change it doesn't age it kind of it has that essential you know, whatever it is about it that remains, it's kind of spirit yeah. remains the same somehow. And and you have in, I mean, look at how they, they do that in the search for Spock in that you have the Excelsior, which is supposed to be the sleeker, sexier, powerful model, you know, of the new, the new, you know, brand spanking new starship. And it's played for laughs. You know, the idea that it's this, bring out that bucket of bolts and the enterprise is is the one it's a bit older it's a, it's been around the block a bit longer but 
it, you know, it's ultimately the Enterprise. It's the, what, it's the ship you want. And then, and then you have the moment which just brings me out in goosebumps again every time I see it at the end of the voyage home when they're wondering what ship they're going to get. And that's when he says, you want that, that big bucket of bolts when they say about the Excelsior and the, and the, and the shuttle just glee, glides over and you get the theme and you see the saucer and it, it, it's, it's brilliant. And the, you know, the, the way it's played in every way is played that, and, and Kirk says, we've, we've come home, you know, and that's it. The, seeing the Enterprise at, at that point is, is it, you know, you're there going, yes, it's back. It, we, we've, yeah, and, and that, and that feeling is there for audiences as well as the characters. And that's rare. You don't get that very often. Mm. And you do and with that In a way, ship. maybe that completely justifies that otherwise totally wildly self-indulgent scene in the motion picture where we do get so much attention put on the ship. I mean, at, at least as, as much as, as yeah. I say, people might ridicule it today. And maybe it seems more ridiculous when you're, you know, you've got all the films on Blu-ray or you've got them all on Netflix or whatever. And you're, you, you know, you can kind of, you have Star Trek at your fingertips at any moment. But in that period where, you know, you were relying on reruns on TV for 10 years, essentially to get your fix of Star Trek and you'd never seen anything like that level of detail, anything like that kind of, aesthetic kind of sophistication in a way in the in the way that the presentation is being made that scene would just be kind of jaw dropping to fans at the time in the cinema and maybe you know we need to sort of um remember that when we when we sort of laugh about that 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 scene i I, I was interested you know you were talking earlier about deep space nine obviously deep space nine doesn't have an enterprise um quite a different aesthetic but i suppose it struck me i know in the the novels again i haven't read many of the continuation novels of deep space nine but i know that at a certain point this is spoilers, sorry, <laughs> but I'm spoiling it from the benefit of not even having read it myself. They blow up that space station because on some of the covers of some of the later novels, you can see the replacement. It looks quite different. It's a Starfleet station. It's not mm. a Cardassian station. And I find that kind of weird. I find it hard to visualize the idea of Deep Space Nine without Deep Space Nine. And of course, what we had recently with the uh, Deep Space Nine documentary, what we left behind is Mm. the writer's room section, which was the part of the film that I think for a lot of fans was the thing they were most excited about, was exactly the prospect of a kind of virtual show revival and what was going to happen in this in this revival and who was going to be doing what and everything. And this was in my mind, particularly today, because as we're recording, uh, it's only a day or two after we learned that very sadly Aaron Eisenberg had died. And one of the highlights of that documentary i suppose it was particularly his interviews and so on and in particular his reaction to the idea that you know first of all that nog was going to be in this storyline it was going to be captain nog and then they decided they were going to kill off nog and, and he was like no you can't do that you can't get rid of nog and i think there's that sort of interesting question like first of all why why it is that fans of ds9 so want to have the idea that a revival might be possible and who knows maybe it, it might be possible but also just this idea of Captain Nog. And, and since uh, Aaron died, there's been a lot of talk like how can uh, Nog be sort of memorialised? I suppose in the same way as when Leonard Nimoy died, uh, they memorialised Spock in the Star Trek Beyond, mm. for example. And some people have been saying, oh, we want a statue of Nog at Starfleet Academy or we want, you know, references <laughs> to Nog or, or yeah. whatever. And I think a lot of people feel like the idea of, of Nog being made a captain is kind of the obvious culmination of that character's journey and it's sort of important to uh, mm. that they that they took him to that point but there's this sense almost like everyone has to be a cat you, you know wharf wants to be a captain nog wants to be a captain uh i'm sure garrett wong wants harry kim to be a captain uh whether or not he's he's still stuck at ensign you, you know forever um but there's something kind of interesting like that like the idea of like picking up on these characters we meet them where you know there's the captain of that ship and they're all in junior roles but somehow there's this idea you know if you wait long enough, everyone's a captain. It's like, um, you know, like uh, Oprah, yeah. everyone gets a car. It's, it's, <laughs> you know, in Star Trek, everyone gets a ship if they just stick around long enough. Um, they which can't about, really yeah. be realistic. I don't think, I mean, unless just no. like the rate of attrition of, of people as you go up, as you get older and you go up the ranks is such that there are only a certain number of people of the right age to be captaining <laughs> ships. But I mean, we're meant to believe the captains are kind of the best and the brightest. Um, so mm. can we really expect every character to make captain eventually? But obviously, you know, we do sort of increasingly see that. I mean, we, you know, we saw that with Sulu uh, in the original series movies, getting his own ship. I mean, we saw it with Riker in the next gen movies. We saw LaForge got his own ship in a future episode of Voyager. Uh, you, you know, Beverly Crusher got her own ship in the, in the 
future of all good things. As I say, Michael Dorn will be furious if Worf doesn't have his own ship <laughs> by, by the time, yeah. whenever it is, yeah. you know, we see him again. So there is this sort of sense, like, I suppose for Star Trek's characters, the idea of like being the captain is kind of the best thing you can be. And therefore that's got to be the destiny of every character. And so there is this sort of question. If you, if you revive these storylines later on, um, is that how it's panned out for everyone? Has everyone kind of fulfilled their destiny? Has everyone kind of um, lived up to everything that they hoped as a younger person? And in particularly when their storyline is so much uh, pinned on their hopes and dreams for the future, it would almost seem sort of terribly unfair if, if they hadn't in a way. But I, I suppose these revivals sort of have to answer these questions because is there something potentially, when you revive these properties, is there something quite, potentially sort of melancholic or even tragic about some of these characters in some of these situations that maybe, I mean, this is one of the things that uh, I was talking about with Chris Nunn in the last episode on generations that there's, there are kind of, there's a sense of the kind of damage that time can do to people and the sense of kind of missed opportunities and regrets uh, and all these sorts of things. And I think it'll be interesting to see when we get this Picard series, which looks like it could be a bit more sort of contemplative and thoughtful in some ways, certainly than any Star Trek we've had for quite a while. Is that going to be an element of the mood that part of the idea of aging is that there is this kind of potentially a kind of sadness associated with that and a sadness associated with the life that hasn't been led and the kind of, um, you know, what has brought these characters to the situation that they're in. Cause probably they're not all going to be in their ideal, perfect, uh, future scenario one way or another. Mm. Yeah. And I, I think that's a, a common thread in a lot of revivals. I think you find that it's all about analyzing where they've, where they've been, where they've come from, how different they are and what, if you're going to revive something, there has to be a reason beyond it just existing for the sake of it. You know, almost all of the revivals have these characters. There is something they've yet, they've got to do. It's unfinished. Their lives are unfinished. Their journeys are unfinished. We may have thought they were finished, but they the writers often find a way to sort of unpick that and go, actually, not quite. You know, and, and, you know, I mean, with something like the X-Files, it was different because the, the whole concept of that is that it's never, there's never going to be an end to that journey. The whole point is that it doesn't end. But with something like, for instance, Gilmore Girls, let's say, which was like a very different kind of property that came back and it was, it was picking up on the characters 10, 15 years later and things haven't quite gone as they hoped, you know, and, and, but there, there is a concluded, conclusive element to that. You could leave it where it is. And I think that's what you find with a lot of these shows in that they, they're attempting to answer a question that maybe you didn't know needed asking, you know, necessarily. And, uh, and I think with Picard, I think with Picard, everyone sort of had that feeling that, that Nemesis wasn't the right way for him to go. You know, it was it was it was inconclusive, and I think Patrick Stewart was fine with it for a long time. But even even in his heart of hearts, I think he knew that it wasn't. I mean, it, much as much as generations, and I'm sure you've talked about this in the previous episode. But much as generations, you know, is divisive in how it ends. It does at least have give Kirk an ending to his story. It, that is a definitive ending. Much as William Shatner might try and write books to the contrary, his, his ending is is there, and. I think there's a real satisfaction in in reviving properties and characters and being able to feel like there's an end to a journey. And I think you'll get that with Picard. And and I think that however it rolls out, however long it's on, whether it's one, two, three seasons, I think it'll be really satisfying to get Jean-Luc to a point where you feel like, okay, yeah, I'm that that that's that's it. That's the end of the story. And that that's 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 a real plus point for a revival and, and a I reason to do it. I suppose the interesting thing about revivals is, of course, they always take place after the ending. So, yes, you might say Nemesis was not the right ending yeah. for that character and they were uh, at one point thinking of doing another sort of final film to round off uh, the next-gen cast that they never made. In some of these cases, though, there has been an ending. I mean, one way or another, all these shows have ended. I mean, the X-Files had an ending and then, you know, came back again years later. And there's this sort of interesting question, I suppose, if the ending is sort of unsatisfactory or leaves loose ends, then that's one way of saying, okay, we can come back and kind of tie up those loose ends. In some of these cases, though, the ending has tied up all the loose ends. Everything is, you know, you do get the sort of happily ever after. 
And then you've sort of got this question of, okay, well, if we want to bring this back, what do we do? Because they can't be happily ever after again. I mean, in the X-Files, it seems like Mulder and Scully keep kind of getting together and splitting up and getting together and splitting up. And that's almost a kind of a sort of symbol of that kind of every time you think there's a sort of happy ending it's not as happy as you thought. Yeah. I mean, Next Gen even kind of played with no. that, with the idea of Picard and Crusher being not married, but divorced. So like they had their happy ending and then life continued and it wasn't mm. quite so happy anymore. And you could argue cynically that, you know, we like the happy ending. I mean, this is something I'm kind of familiar with as someone who writes a lot about real people's lives and tries to structure their lives in a way that is dramatically interesting for people to read. And often that is a case of trying to give a story not necessarily a happy ending, but a kind of satisfying ending. And often, really, that's a case mm. of choosing where mm. you stop telling the story. Do you know what I mean? And sometimes you stop before the things that make it seem a bit more murky or a bit more complicated or a bit less happy one way or another. It sort of reminds me a little bit what you were saying, you know, with some of these things. Of, I don't know if you've seen the uh, Stephen Sondheim musical Into the Woods, uh, but that has an amazing yes. trick I haven't seen the movie version of it. I don't know how it plays out there. But in the stage version, the first act is quite a long first act. And it tells, this is a, a musical for anyone who's not familiar with it, based on fairy tales, basically various fairy tales kind of being mashed together. And it tells a story uh, that is like a kind of fairy tale story right through the kind of shape of the story, right through to the traditional happy ending. Everyone gets together with the person they're meant to get together with, gets married, lives happily ever after. Boom, that's the end. Big sort of finale. But actually, that's just the interval. And then the whole second half is where you pick up a few years later or whatever, and nothing is quite as happy as it was supposed to be. You know, their marriages are on the rocks. There's kind of problems brewing and so on. And I've seen productions of that show. It, the first half feels so much like an ending of a, of a, like a, a musical or a, or a fairy tale or whatever that they have to stop people at the door from leaving the theatre because people think, oh, well, that's it. They, they, they can't comprehend that there's more story to come after they've seen what appears to be an entire uh, story. And so I suppose that that's sort of interesting question, like if you're picking up years later where you did have an ending, what do you do? You know, what is it that you're kind of picking up from? And in some ways... I don't know, maybe Star Trek's never quite had to deal with that because the original series movies, you know, the, the original series never got its ending. It didn't get a finale. It just sort of stopped abruptly. Next Gen, you know, the TV show got a great ending, but they went straight into the first movie and the movie, you know, sort of took place almost immediately after. And in any case, their ending kind of wrapped up the TV show, but it also gave the impression, well, the adventure just continues. They keep going on, you know, next week will be the next mission and we just won't be tuning in kind of thing. But in a few months time, we'll catch up with them in the cinema. Picard, I think you're right. Again, you know, maybe Nemesis didn't quite sort of tie the bow on it. Arguably, when you get to something like The Undiscovered Country, that was the perfect ending for those characters. And I guess that's one reason why a lot of those actors didn't want to come back and do those scenes at the beginning of Generations because they've, you know, Leonard Nimoy, DeForest Kelly, uh, felt like they'd, they'd said goodbye to those characters. Do you know what I mean? And there was an extra bit of story for Kirk, but there wasn't really any extra story for anyone else by that point. Uh, I suppose, obviously, we found out about Sulu having a daughter and stuff. So you, you could say that there were kind of nuggety stuff in there for them. We've got this Breaking Bad movie coming out soon, uh, following Jesse Pinkman and what happened after the events of Breaking Bad. Everyone thought that story was over. And now we find out there's kind of another chapter. So this is sort of an interesting question. When you think something's ended and then you find out it hasn't, what are the expectations there compared to when it was unsatisfying in the first place? It, it, it's one of those things with it, it, the, maybe that, that, that's the ultimate point. You know, the, the, the ending is the point. And I think. That's I, I, guess I go back to the fact that it, it, it's the reason I think to revive. It's it's the maybe not reboot, but certainly to revive in order to get that catharsis for the audience of you know feeling like the the circle is complete. You know, and and I think it's it's as exciting to see. I think it's as exciting to see the end of a story as it is the beginning. So yeah, I, I'm I'm happy to see more. I, I'm I just can't wait for Picard. I'm just so ready. And we just have to hope. I mean, I was quite surprised. I always assumed Picard was going to be like a limited length, you know, maybe a sort of one, almost kind of mini series. Do you know what I mean? It was mm. going to kind of wrap stuff up for Picard and that was going to be a full stop uh, for that character. Mm. Now we find they're planning maybe, you know, they're planning the second season. They're thinking about a third season. Mm. I mean, it, 
that seems slightly weird to me, the idea that somehow this this thing, which is effectively a coder, that's really what Picard is, isn't it? It's a sort of coder yeah. for the next generation, yeah. uh, could take on a life of its mm. own and could kind of run and run. We just sort of have to hope that, you know, having slightly fumbled the ending for that crew with Nemesis, whether Picard runs to two seasons, three seasons, five seasons, whatever it does, we kind of have to hope that they've got an end point in mind uh, or that they, at the very least, will come up with a really good endpoint because it, it would be frustrating for them not to manage that again. And we have seen that with Star Trek before. I mean, the original series didn't really get an ending. Enterprise, I would say, arguably didn't really get a proper mm. ending. Um, mm. no. You know, DS9, Voyager, Next Gen, they they all did manage to wrap them up with finales that that kind of performed that job very well. And the original series did, of course, with the Undiscovered Country. And I think I think mm. you're right in a way. Like the the next gen movie era is sorely lacking an ending, and and Picard gives an opportunity to sort of um, put the lid down on that box finally. But before we get to the point well, of doing that, you know, hopefully to open that box up and uh, see what more yeah. wonderful, unexpected uh, treasures are within. Well, talking of endings, it's gonna be I great. Think, um, we've probably been talking for uh, long enough today and it's time to bring <laughs> this podcast to an end as well. But before we go, Tony, do you want to let the listeners know um, where they can find you uh, elsewhere in the podcasting sphere and also on social media if they want to get in touch with you? What's the best way to do that? Yeah, before we both get rebooted <laughs> and they have whole new younger younger hosts of primitive culture, which, yep. <laughs> which is surely going to happen. Um, yeah, you can find me uh, mainly on on uh, Twitter at AJ Black Writer and at my website, AJBlackWriter.com, uh, where you'll find out uh, all of what I'm doing, podcasting, writing, and details on my upcoming uh, book, which will have plenty of Star Trek content, uh, content in it as well. But I'll talk more about that towards the end of the year when i'm i'll be back on primitive culture again before then i'm i'm a, I'm, I'm here for the, 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 there won't, there won't be a 10 year hand, so. gap hopefully this time so you know <laughs> you won't have to wait not. too long to, to hear from us uh both <laughs> podcasting together again <laughs> well thanks tony as ever for joining me talking about revivals in star trek is not the only thing we've been doing on trek fm this week so here's a listen to what else you might have missed out on on the network previously on trek.fm earl gray Okay, that's excellent. And it'll be interesting to see how we interpreted the topic because I know I may have interpreted it uh, maybe a little differently than others did. We'll see. Is this another time travel thing? No, I was, I was going to say no time travel for me as long as Jellico doesn't come into this. Sure. Okay, that's, so we'll make okay. that deal then. Awesome. <laughs> I'm in. All right. Literary treks. And, you know, the, the stakes are, are really big. You know, we'll we'll get there, but you know, this Borg ship threatens Earth and all this kind of stuff, and it just feels like it, it's it's a lot of really comic booky, over the top stuff that doesn't quite fit right with the novel that came before it and the novel that came after it. If that makes sense. <laughs> Primitive culture: a look at history and culture through Star Trek. And Next Gen Arriving was, was this sort of, wow, wow, this is, looks incredible. I know when we look at sort of first season Next Gen now, what we're going is, wow, this is really slow and stagey. But in fact, it was, it was incredible. It was absolutely um, game-changing. The Edge, a Star Trek Discovery podcast. Only because I was watching little bits of Emissary recently is that he would see himself wearing that awful purple swimsuit and think, oh, God, I can't wear that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my every, gosh. Every time I see it, I'm like, whoa, I'm really glad I'm not wearing 24th century clothing. <laughs> if you wanted me to murder an entire society, fine. <laughs> but I'm not wearing that bathing suit. Too revealing. Oh. That's where I draw the line. <laughs> That's funny. And that's what else is happening on Trek.fm. Check out all these shows and join the conversation about your favourite corner of the Star Trek universe and beyond. You'll find us wherever you get your podcasts. If you're an Apple user, be sure to hit the subscribe button in Apple Podcasts on iPhone, iPad or Apple TV or the desktop iTunes app to get the latest episodes as soon as they're published. And please leave us a star rating and a written review. If you're not an Apple user, we've got you covered as well. You can find our shows on Google Play Music, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spreaker, SoundCloud, Windows Phone, in most third-party apps, and you can stream and download the MP3 file from our website or grab the RSS link. We'd love to hear your thoughts on today's show, and there are many ways for you to do that. 
The best place to join in the larger conversation is the Babel Conference, our listeners group on Facebook. Just type Babel, B-A-B-E-L, into the search field on Facebook and it should come right up. If you'd like to send us an email, you can use the form on our website at trek.fm slash contact. Choose to send to a show and select Primitive Culture, and that will come right to us. You can also find the network on Twitter at trek.fm and on Facebook at facebook.com slash trek.fm. If you'd like to help us keep all our shows coming to you each week, you can become a patron of the network on Patreon. Visit patreon.com slash trek.fm, that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash trek.fm, to get all the details. Perks include early access to episodes, exclusive content, producer credits and more, available through our special patrons website, Patron Zone. It requires a great deal of money to produce, host and distribute these shows each month, so we really appreciate any support you can give us, and we hope you'll join the team. Again, you can find all our details at patreon.com slash trekfm. We'd like to take a moment now to thank our associate producers on Primitive Culture, Amy Nelson, Clara Cook and Tony Black. Amy is a presenter of many other shows on the network, and you can find her on Twitter at at Miss Amy Nelson. Clara and Tony were two of the former co-hosts of this show, and they'll be popping back from time to time. You can find Clara on Twitter at at Clara Jean MC, and Tony at at AJ Black Writer. You're blended all right. <laughs>